I will now introduce our platform party. Starting on the far left, we have Senator George J. Mitchell, Chancellor Emeritus of Queen's University, former US Special Envoy to Northern Ireland, and of course, Chair of the All Party Talks that led to the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Simon Coveney. Simon Coveney, TD, Thanishta, and Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade. <laughs> Karen Bradley, MP, Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. <laughs> Professor Hastings Donnan, Director of the Sander George J. Mitchell Institute for Global Peace, Security and Justice. And finally, our host for today's proceedings, journalist and broadcaster, Yvette Sapiro. I now call upon Professor Hastings Donnan, Director of the Center, George J. Mitchell Institute for Global Peace, Security and Justice, to open our proceedings. Uh, Senator Mitchell, Secretary of State, friends, colleagues, and distinguished guests. It's clearly a very great privilege uh, for me to offer you a warm welcome here to the Sir William Whitlaw Hall at Queen's University, Belfast, to mark this occasion, building peace, the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, 20 years on. I'm sure, or I hope, that you're all looking forward to this event uh, as much as I am. Uh, and you will need to, because we're going to continue right through for a three-hour uh, session. Uh, I think, like all birthday parties, it's important to have uh, a goodie bag and you should have found on your seat there's a bottle of water for you and a cereal bar to sustain you uh, across <laughs> the meeting. As Ryan Feeney said, my name is Hastings Donnan. Uh, I'm director of the Senator George J. Mitchell Institute for Global Peace, Security and Justice. And as many of you, I think, will already know, uh, the Mitchell Institute was launched at Queen's in 2016. And through the research, education, and civic engagement uh, in which the Institute engages, it seeks to make a practical difference to the lives of ordinary people struggling with the aftermath of conflict. We're nothing if not ambitious. These are lofty ideals, but lofty ideals which we feel obliged morally to aspire to. My colleagues in the Institute come from many different academic disciplines and they conduct internationally comparative research in many varied conflict and post-conflict settings across the globe. So they're working not just in Ireland uh, but practically everywhere else, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Latin America, which are struggling uh, to end conflict and to bring peace. What they share in common is an approach that not only focuses on the transformation of politics and political processes, but an approach that also emphasizes the importance of studying social transformation. That is, the social and cultural processes for healing in society, and the everyday ways in which all of us can contribute to peace building through our small acts of civility and respect for difference. So when we're here today to celebrate a particular historic occasion, we're also here to celebrate those everyday acts in which we all continuously must engage if we're to build peace in our country. I like to think that the Senator, Senator Mitchell, agreed to let us to use his name, that this was in recognition of the quality, significance, and reach of our research and our practical contributions to peace building. He didn't let us use his name easily. Uh, he did write back and say, please write and explain to me exactly what you're doing in the Institute. But in the end, he found value there and we're very appreciative of the fact that we can call it the Senator George J. Mitchell Institute for Global Peace, Security and Justice. It's therefore hugely significant that the Senator is with us here today at Queen's and that he's been joined by so many key figures 
from 1998. The aim of our event uh, is twofold. It's to reflect on what has been achieved by the Good Friday Agreement, but it is also to reflect on what remains to be done, and maybe more importantly, how we might do it. At this point, I'm going to invite Yvette Shapiro, a journalist, broadcaster, and good friend of the Mitchell Institute, to come to the podium to say a little bit about the format, format of this afternoon's event. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank Professor Donnan for inviting me to play a role in this landmark event. It's an absolute privilege uh, to be here this afternoon. Over the next three hours, we'll be looking back and we'll be looking forward. Shortly, we will be hearing from the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Karen Bradley, and the Tanishta, Simon Coveney. If you've had a look at your information packs, you'll know that we're going to hear, of course, from our keynote speaker, Senator George Mitchell, whose hard work, determination and wisdom brought the deal over the line 20 years ago today. After that, there will be three panel discussions featuring some of the architects of that agreement, as well as leading figures from policing, justice, politics, the church and the community. There's a lot to remember, a lot to reflect upon and to learn, and perhaps by the end of the day, a vision for a new way forward in Northern Ireland. But first, let's take a look at this short film. I'm pleased to announce that the two governments and the political parties of Northern Ireland have reached agreement. Even now, this will not work unless in your will and in your mind you make it work. It's a day we should treasure, a day when agreement and accommodation have taken the face of difference and division. In the days to come, there may be those who will try to undermine this great achievement, not only with words, but perhaps also with violence. I'm very happy for people in Northern Ireland. A lot of people have talked about a new beginning. I hope and believe it will be. I'm sure the positive news of today will continue to be built on. I look forward to the future. I see a great opportunity there for us to start a healing process here in Northern Ireland. It's only on the basis of equality, fairness, and respect for our differences that we can begin to heal the deep divisions between our people. These negotiations and the new arrangements are part of our collective journey from the failures of the past towards a future together as equals. I am convinced that we have taken a step today of which we can be proud. We are giving something to the future. It's about recognizing the need to encompass all attitudes and all opinions, all religions, all creeds, all colors, sexes, disabilities, within a diverse and honorable society. We have interrupted the culture of failure in Northern Ireland. There is no going back. Yes, 71.12%. First First Minister in Northern Ireland and First Deputy First Minister. In Northern Ireland. tragedies of the past have left a deep and profoundly regrettable legacy of suffering. We must never forget those who have died or been injured and their families. But we can best honour them through a fresh start. In which we firmly dedicate ourselves to the achievement of reconciliation, tolerance and mutual trust and to the protection and vindication of the human rights 
of all. We are committed to partnership, equality and mutual respect. As the basis of relationships within Northern Ireland, between North and South and between these islands. We reaffirm our total and absolute commitment to exclusively democratic and peaceful means. Of resolving differences on political issues and our opposition to any use or threat of force by others. For any political purpose, whether in regard to this agreement or otherwise. We acknowledge the substantial differences between our continuing and equally legitimate political aspirations. We will endeavour to strive in every practical way towards reconciliation and rapprochement within the framework of democratic and agreed arrangements. Accordingly, in the spirit of Concord, we strongly commend this agreement to the people. Because of the work you've done, I was born in a peaceful Northern Ireland. So thank you. Listening to others is not always easy, but it's important if we want to live in a world that's fair for everybody. We need to remember what we promised to continue building peace for children like me. For children like me. For children like me. Some fairly rapt attention um, from some of our guests in the front row as they saw their younger selves from 20 years ago today. And of course, some in the room seeing that and some of that for the first time, having not even been born when that agreement was signed. Um, it's my pleasure now to welcome the Right Honourable Karen Bradley, MP, Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. Thank you very much. It is a great pleasure to be here today as we mark the 20th anniversary of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. And it seems right that we should be doing so here in this great historic place of learning where there is so much history, so much past, but also it is the place of the future. Some of you will know I'm a relatively new Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. And you cannot imagine the honour it is to be here alongside so many of the people who helped to shape history on that day 20 years ago, as we have just seen in that incredibly powerful video. Let us be in no doubt. The agreement that was reached 20 years ago was one of historic magnitude, a landmark in the history of Northern Ireland, of Ireland and of these islands. It was an occasion when politics triumphed over the division and violence that had torn Northern Ireland apart over the preceding two decades. So on behalf of the United Kingdom government, I would like to reiterate our sincerest thanks to those who helped make 10th of April 1998 a reality. People like John Major and Albert Reynolds who began the process in the early 1990s and Tony Blair and Bertie Ahern, who saw it through to its conclusion in 1998. And from the United States, President Bill Clinton and Senator George Mitchell, who made such an important contribution and who I'm delighted will receive the 83rd and 84th freedom of the city of Belfast later today. And of course, to Northern Ireland's political leaders, people like David Trimble, John Hume and others on all sides whose courage, vision and leadership in 1998 should continue to be an inspiration to all of us in Northern Ireland today. There is little doubt that as a result of the agreement, Northern Ireland has taken huge strides forward in the past 20 years. The security situation transformed, the economy growing, unemployment at record lows, tourism booming, exports thriving, and yes, the world's most popular TV show, Game of Thrones, made right here. 
So let's not be shy in celebrating the successes of the past 20 years. But let's also be realistic and recognize that there remain huge challenges. We still face the real threat from dissidents. Society remains too divided. Our economy is too dependent on the public sector and we still need to address the past. And we've been absolutely clear in our commitment to avoiding a hard border and no border down the Irish Sea. We've begun discussions between Ireland, the EU and the UK on this, and we look forward to making pro progress together. And of course, there is making sure that devolution here is restored so that Northern Ireland has a properly functioning executive and assembly so that local decisions are in local hands. So be assured, the restoration of devolution is the UK government's number one political priority, as I know it is of the Irish government and Simon Coveney, who will follow, who, with whom I work so closely. The commitment of both our respective governments to the Belfast Agreement remains steadfast. And if there was ever any doubt as to why the agreement is as re relevant today as it was 20 years ago, then we just had such a powerful reminder with the film of those young people we've just seen. Because at the heart and center of all that we do in honoring and implementing the agreement is to build a stronger society and a more secure future, not just for this generation, but for generations to come. Later today, I will have the pleasure of visiting Sullivan Upper School in Hollywood and speaking to the young students, the first post-agreement generation, about their hopes for the future. Because it was those hopes that motivated those who made the agreement, and it's what should motivate everyone in Northern Ireland today. To spread prosperity and opportunity for all, to re-establish political stability, and to build a Northern Ireland which everyone is proud to call home. A Northern Ireland fit for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary of State. And where there is one, there will also be the other. And may I invite Simon Coveney, TD Tonister, to address you now, please. We come in pairs, I see. Senator Mitchell, Secretary of State, political leaders who are with us today, Vice Chancellor, Ugrini Yushla, August ladies and gentlemen. The 10th of April 1998 was an extraordinary day to be from these islands. The news of the agreement which trickled down over the airwaves on that Good Friday afternoon gave us a new truth, agreement, unlikely, improbable agreement that most people thought wasn't possible, had been achieved. Relief and joy took the place of despair. A new hope and, believe it or not, a new faith in politics, in our people and in each other, took root that day. It was a remarkable time. It's an honor and a privilege to be here today with so many people who stood then and who continue to stand today steadfastly with the people of these islands, their two governments, and of course, their political parties. People who walked a hard road with us 20 years ago and who have stayed with us on this journey of peace and reconciliation where, is, where there is still a lot of traveling to do. I listened carefully to the challenge set out by the young people in the video we saw a few minutes ago. I believe it is one that we can rise to, and it is one that I know the Secretary of State and I are utterly committed to. I want to speak briefly today about three, th three themes, to remember, to renew, and to reconcile. The first is the need to remember. We need to keep in mind that what, what it was like before the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. 
and to remember why we felt such joy and optimism two decades ago. After 20 years of peace, fragile and imperfect peace, but, but peace nonetheless, some memories have faded. It's all too easy to forget the extent and the impact of the conflict on people here, a legacy of loss, injury, fear and violence has left deep scars, and I learn more about that every time I make the journey to Belfast. And tragically, those wounds are not confined to my generation or the generation that came before me. The traces of the conflict are physical, social, and psychological on our landscape and are still very evident today. Evident in segregated schools and communities, in peace walls, in areas of economic deprivation, one of which I visited today in East Belfast, where there is still 62% unemployment in the local ward that I visited. And of course, a long and shared border, which still remains, of course. They surface from time to time in Belfast, in Dublin, in London, in Oma, in Armagh, and in many other towns and hinterlands. And these traces pale away in comparison to the pain and loss experienced by the very many people who were most personally affected by the conflict. The victims, the survivors, the bereaved, the injured, their carers, and indeed their loved ones. If there is one particular area in which we have failed in 20 years to make sufficient progress together, and I know that there is more than one, it is what we often call the legacy of the past. We've used the phrase so often that we possibly risk losing sight of what it means. Thousands of, upon thousands of individual, individuals and family stories, some stories that are still barely whispered and stories that we think we understand but probably have yet to grasp. Shakespeare in his play, The Tempest, a play, ironically, about a storm and an island. Famously used the quote, what's past is prologue. And does anybody doubt it here? We owe it to the memory of all of those who were lost to a conflict to make progress now in addressing the past. Time is not going to lessen that debt. Rather, it will compound it. What's past is prologue. We cannot undo the past, but we can certainly change how it shapes the future in terms of the leadership that we can offer. And that leads me to the second point, the need for renewal. The words of the agreement are as true today as they were two decades ago. And perhaps after 20 years, we need to commit again to a new start, to a new beginning, starting with politics. Despite uh, the sometimes strident voices of despondency, I believe that the agreement has profoundly transformed lives on these islands, and it will continue to do so, as Karen pointed out earlier. It remains the cornerstone of the peace process and the fundamental framework for relationships across these islands. The people voted overwhelmingly for this agreement and they still believe in it today. I know all of us gathered here today also believe profoundly in this agreement, in what it has delivered and what it has the potential to deliver in the future, with a restored power-sharing executive and assembly as its beating heart. Today is an opportunity to renew that commitment to see the promise of the agreement, reconciliation, tolerance, and mutual respect fulfilled across communities and across political parties. And that brings me to the last of the three themes, reconciliation, perhaps the most difficult and most important of them all. Reconciliation, which means so many different things to different people and is the hardest and yet most essential aspect of any peace process. And for the lives of the young people that moved us earlier in the video, in 20 years, we have traveled a long way on this path, even if the journey is still very much incomplete. 
Long years of a hard history leave us failing uh, all too easily, or falling all too easily into oppositions. If I'm this, then at least I'm not that. It's us or them. For all of this to work, for us to live together on these islands as neighbours and as friends if possible, we have to find ways to stop shouting at each other as if across an unbridged chasm. 20 years on, we should look around and realise that for so many people, I hope of a new generation, they are already calmly crossing the many bridges that have grown to span that gap. And the genius of the Good Friday Agreement is that it allows, indeed enables us, to find ways to bridge and ultimately to celebrate our differences and the diversity in Northern Ireland. It also allows for an expansive Irishness, an expansive Britishness, a space for the people who are both and who are shared citizens of the two co-guarantor states of this agreement. A more complex set of identities and allegiances is possible and will only enrich us all if we can make it a reality. That is the promise of the agreement. And it is the one that we, a new generation, need to make happen. We can begin today. We have a further chance and we should take it. Remember, renew, reconcile. Thank you.